for you being here today. Praise His name. Amen.
opportunity to sing to you. Your love truly does. Is, uh, it seems, not seems, it is boundless, Lord. And when I think of your love for me, um, to, to really take that in, that, um, that your love for me, Lord, reaches to the heavens, stretches to the sky, that it, uh, you, you know no end that you won't go to for me, Lord. And I thank you for that. And you already showed that by your son going to the cross. And I just thank you for your, uh, Lord, for your love for me. And uh, I thank you for this opportunity to, to sing that back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Two, three, four. Your love is
Lord, I thank you for, again, for your blessings as we come to take the tithe and the offering. May we truly recognize this opportunity to worship you in this way and not to regard it as just another um, another part of the uh, of the service that we just kind of pass along to you. But Lord, to recognize the worth of this time. We say thank you, Lord, for how you've blessed us, how you uh, shower us with those blessings continually. We give you thanks. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for these young people. And Lord, I just pray a special blessing on them as they hear your word from Mrs. D today. And I pray that you would um, speak clearly to them and let them know how much you love them, Lord, and, and that they are cared for. Lord, I pray that you would um, just be with them all now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we heard a few shots fired yesterday. Did anybody have success? The deer did. Okay. <laughs> well, how long does hunting season go for deer, legally? Four weeks? Okay. I'm sorry? Muzzle loading. Okay. That'll take about a half a day to fill that one up. Just to get the lead in there. Okay. What? I was too the other night. Oh. Well, it's good to have all of you here today. And I just want to praise God for you being here. And even as preparing this message, this message will be a little bit longer than normal. Uh, as I say that, that means you get to wiggle and adjust a little bit. If you can stand up, move around, uh, that's okay. But this is a message that I believe is very much for our time today. The question has often been asked, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's right. Well, it's just amazing how this all ties together, isn't it? That's from the God's, it's actually before that, but it's a good one from the God's Not Dead movie. Well, that's what we're going to find today in chapter 3 in the book of Daniel. Now, as you read through chapter 3, and I know because on the Family Connection, I send out what the next passage is going to be. I know that all of you read chapter 3 diligently all week long, right? Don't tell me. So, as you go through chapter 3 here, you're going to say, where's Daniel? I, I don't see Daniel in here anywhere. Why isn't he with his three friends? There's actually some scholars out there that suggest that Daniel may have been compromising because he was in the palace uh, and he probably had let down his guard and stuff like that. I don't mind that for a minute. Okay, there's no place in God's Word that even alludes to something like that. The reality is, Daniel was in the palace, and he was doing the business about the palace, and he wasn't with everybody else, okay? His three friends were with the other uh, wise leaders and, and all those people there, but Daniel probably wasn't, okay? And you just have to go back to chapter 2, remember context? Context, context, context. That's the three rules of interpretation of Scripture. Okay? In the context, going back to chapter 2, that's where he was, in the palace. So, you know, how many of you actually read newspapers? I thought so. Oh, a few of you do. Yes, okay, that's good. Online newspapers, and I do online newspapers. Uh, basically because if I don't, we have a stack building up that I get behind on so I need to take a half an hour every day to go through online newspapers. Uh, be careful, some of those online sites are really strange. Uh, don't believe everything you read just because it's on the internet. We. Some of you remember that commercial from Geico. Anyway, uh, it's because the internet doesn't make it true. But a lot of the online newspapers, if they're like a Washington Post or New York Times or Bangor Daily News, uh, you know, you'll find a lot of stuff in there, and a lot of it is just horrendous, isn't it? It's, it's just very negative. We're reading and seeing and hearing about people who are being found guilty and imprisoned because they have chosen to live their lives in obedience to Jesus and His Word. Just this past week, I was reading an article, and it was in various news sources, so the accuracy of it is probably pretty true, where a Muslim was uh, given a huge financial award by a jury or a judge because he was wrongfully terminated from his job. Now, he was terminated from his job because he did not want to deliver beer to a business because that goes against his Islamic beliefs. Okay? So the judge basically said that you can't force someone to do something that's against their beliefs. You fired him inappropriately, therefore we're going to give him this money. Hmm. It's not equal, is it? Bakers, photographers, 
pastors, multiple others, because they've chosen to live in obedience to Jesus Christ, they are being sued and or imprisoned. Okay? And you know I'm not making this stuff up, right? <laughs> I can't be that creative. You know, my friends, there's nothing new today compared to what we see in chapter 3. You and I must keep on living as children of light. And, and, and even as you look at chapter 3, amongst all of the false gods that were being followed, none of those were being imprisoned because they were going <coughs> along with the system, with the culture, with the society. It's only those who were following God and who refused to compromise against God. So, what do I hope for us to glean from this chapter today? Well, basically it's this. Live as children of light, even in the midst of a dark world. Okay? You're going to hear that several times. I hope when you walk out of here later this morning, you'll think to yourself, okay, what was it? I'm, oh, I've got to live as a child of light, even in the midst of a dark world. Okay? So that's what we're looking at. Now, I'm not going to be reading the whole chapter out loud again. So if you're not in chapter 3 in the book of Daniel in your Bible, please go there, whether it's by turning the pages, pushing the electronic device right in the appropriate place. However you get to Daniel chapter 3, let's do that. We're going to be looking, first of all, at the crisis in the first seven verses of Daniel chapter 3. Now, between chapters 2 and 3, uh, we don't know how many years have passed. The majority of scholars suggest probably about 20 years have gone by since that vision that Nebuchadnezzar had earlier where he saw this statue with the various uh, metals, precious metals and not so precious uh, objects in it. And as the stone from heaven came down, crushed it and all that and built up into a mountain. So as we recall here, Going back last week, Nebuchadnezzar did have an idea as to who God truly was. But we're going to see today that just because he knew certain information did not make him a different person. Just because a person knows the Bible, knows the story about salvation, does not mean they're saved. Okay, We see that with Nebuchadnezzar as well. Sadly, in these verses here, we see that the king had ordered that an image of gold be raised up in his honor. Now, as you look at this, and as you look at your Bibles, you're, going to, you're saying, Wow, wait! 90 feet tall! Now, our windmill on the farm was 33 feet tall. That was tall enough for me. You know, that's scary. But 90 feet tall, out on a plane, so every Everybody can see it. From far, far away, you're going to see this gold image that has been raised up. Sadly, Nebuchadnezzar is trying to raise up something in his own honor to this ridiculous height. And even though his vision, his dream earlier, just the head and the shoulders was gold, here the whole thing is covered in gold. How many starving people could that have fed? And as you look at the scene here in these seven verses, it almost seems like a test of loyalty among the leadership towards the king. As we read the words that the herald is proclaiming, <clears throat> excuse me, proclaiming, it seems very obvious that this is a major event. Uh, musically, talk about a noisy event. Uh, there, there are all kinds of instruments noted there. And if that's not enough, Daniel uses the phrase, all kinds of music. So there was a full-fledged orchestra, if you will, that was there for this. Now, it's important to understand that the word here for worship refers to worshiping deity. Okay? So whether the image was in Nebuchadnezzar's likeness or whether it was in the likeness of one of Nebuchadnezzar's favorite gods, the whole thing is worshiping deity. It's not just bowing down. It's worshiping deity. Well, that's obviously going to separate those who were tolerant 
from those who were committed to wholeheartedly worshiping Jehovah God. And it's such a public event that everybody's going to see who is and who is not supportive of the king's edict. The herald makes it known that it's an act of worship, and since it's bowing down before a golden image, it means worshiping something or someone <laughs> other than the one true God. Further, in case you just didn't get it, the herald states here, whoever does not, does not fall down and worship, will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And it was for everyone, because it's every language. Everyone there. Now, what was this fire? It's very possible it was the same type of fire, a huge uh, device that was used to melt down all this gold so it could be put on the wood, stuff like that. Scholars suggest that the, the heat needed for that type of thing would be about 1,800 degrees. Now, I just say 100 degrees, and we say that's hot, but multiply that out 18 times. So, you've got this here. And all these people that are in attendance probably could see the blazing furnace, the fiery furnace over here. You probably feel a little bit of the heat. I don't know. It's a little ways off probably. You definitely see the smoke going up in the air. So in verse 7, it seems that once the music started, the whole group fell down and worshipped just as they've been told to do. Of course, we know, because we read ahead, that not the whole crowd fell down and worshipped. But if you are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you must be thinking to yourself, wow, the world has gotten very dark. The world seems to be set against all that is of God. And that's when we see that not everyone in verses 8 through 10 chose to fall down and worship. Do you remember in school, teachers used to say, now don't tattle. Some, some parents say, would you stop tattling? You know, well, that's kind of the picture I have of these officials that come to the king. They're tattling. They're snitches. Uh, I don't know if they were spies or what, or if they were just making sure, because it seems like there's a conspiracy against the followers of God here. Does it seem that way sometime in our culture? There's a conspiracy against Christians? Uh, I'm not sure it's a conspiracy. I think it's real. <laughs> it's, it's very blatant and obvious. Well, they wanted to get rid of those who worship God only. Now, you're thinking to yourself, why did they go talk to the king? Well, the king probably is off someplace else, else up close to that area, and he's not going to be able to identify who is or who is not worshiping him. He just sees this vast crowd on their faces, as it were, worshiping. These guys, probably from a human perspective, they were very jealous, I don't know, because the reality is they got these Jews who are in charge of them in their own country. How wrong is that, they might think. What, we're, we capture them and yet they're telling us what to do. And they were not in those positions that they wanted to be. So these, the word here is they brought charges against, the NIV says denounced. I, I love the phrase, I'm thinking, okay, denounced brought charges against what exactly was it. And the word literally means ate the pieces of. It's a very hostile word. And I'm thinking, okay, in English, what would that be like? Have you ever been chewed out? Okay. Multiply the intensity of that a bunch of times. Uh, I've, I've heard the phrase chewed out and spit out. You know, that, that's the picture. These guys did this against uh, these three Hebrews. Now, these individuals went through the normal greeting process. You know, you look at this and say, wow, they're really buttering Nebuchadnezzar up. Well, yeah, they were, but this was part of the normal procedure. Then they laid the background for why they were bringing the charges. And they go on with their accusatory reports. Basically, they didn't bow. You told them to bow. They didn't do it. And and please understand, Satan has always been anti-Jew. Did you know that? You see, throughout history, 
where nations, people, set themselves against the Jewish people. Well, that's because they're God's chosen people. God chose them. Jesus was a Jew. And so you see this right away as the anti-Semitic idea. And the reason they chose to worship the one true God. They were not going to worship just any false god, even though they did at times, but they got punished for it. So that makes them completely different from everybody else. Did you catch that? Completely different from everybody else. Wow, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? The Bible says we're to be strangers and aliens in this world. We're to be completely different from everybody else. You know, the anti-Jewish sentiment continues. It raises its ugly head time and time again. And it doesn't just stop there. Now, the antagonism and hatred is directed at all who would follow Jesus. And even though the Christian lives in this world, we work in this world, and we try to be a blessing to all those around us, if it is obvious that a person is a true follower of Jesus Christ, and if a follower of Jesus Christ refuses to worship at the idol of humanism or tolerance or political correctness, there becomes a public denouncement and an overt attempt to silence or rid the world of the true follower of Jesus Christ. Now, folks, I'm not complaining. Please don't, please don't think, well, the pastor's up there ranting and raving politically. No, he's not. He's helping us to understand. I want to help you to understand. This is what's happening. Be prepared for it. The Bible warns us about it, but not to stick our heads in the sand, but to keep on living for Jesus as children of light, even in the midst of a dark world. Amen. We don't have to fear this stuff. Just recognize it. Understand it. Don't deny it. Don't say, oh, you just think it. No, it's not just what I think. This is what is happening. Read the papers. Listen to the news. Read the Bible. It's there for us. It's all part of Satan's plan. Jesus warned us. At this point, the three men are named specifically Fred, George, and Barney. Okay, you got that? And their crime is listed. First of all, they have disregarded the king. In other words, they don't think he's special. They're not willing to do whatever he wants them to do. Secondly, they don't serve the king's gods. I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar, if they're good enough for you and you think they're great, they should be worshiping your gods, right? Thirdly, they refused to worship the golden image. Now, why do you suppose Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did this? Because they understood that they needed to live as children of light, even in the midst of a dark world. Now, you recall, the penalty for refusing to worship the golden image was death in a fiery furnace. Well, let's go on and say verses 13 through 18, what happens? Now, I, I know, I've got a really warped sense of humor, and I like the old Looney Tune cartoons, okay? And, and as, I, as I look at this uh, verse 13 here, I, I have Yosemite Sam pictured as King Nebuchadnezzar. And you know, when Yosemite Sam just got all bent out of shape and hot and angry and bothered, smoke comes out of his ears, his hat flies off his head, he goes, you know, a bunch of other stuff, which I can't say publicly because I don't understand what he said. But that's the kind of the picture. He was so infuriated. One translation says he was furious with rage. So he gave orders for them to be brought before him. So the king asked the three of them if that report which he had just received could actually be true. Now, Nebuchadnezzar must have liked these guys. Because in verse 15, we see that he already went back on what he said earlier. Remember earlier, he said, whoever doesn't immediately gets thrown into the furnace. Well, what's he doing here? He's giving them another chance to do what he told them to do. Why? So, Nebuchadnezzar says, guys, listen, I'm going to have the orchestra play again. 
Okay? They've rehearsed already. They know what they're doing. Now they're going to play again. When you hear them play, just fall down and worship. You do that, we'll be good. We'll be, we'll be just nice and close once again. But if you don't, punishment is going to be immediate. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar does what nobody should ever do. He taunts God. He says, not even your God could rescue you from me. Oh, did you know what he just did? He placed himself above God. <coughs> he acted like God couldn't overpower him. Now, Christian, do you understand that this is happening today? We're being told that if we'll simply promote and condone evil, everything will be just fine. Now, folks, they don't say, we want you to promote and condone evil. You know, that would be obvious. But, well, of course not. Okay? But what they do want you to do is to compromise God's word. They want you to compromise your lives and say, it's okay. It's okay to do this and this and this. And, you know, we appreciate the fact that you believe in Jesus, but we feel like you're a little narrow, you're a little limiting, and you ought to be more open to other options. After all, Islam teaches pretty much the same thing that your Bible teaches. I'm, am I being facetious enough? <laughs> but it, do you understand what's being said? And we could go on and on, and I won't get into all the specifics, and you can figure that out without me going on and on. But we've seen time and time again this happening. If we don't do these things, there's going to be punishment. Oh, they won't do that. Oh, yes, they do, folks. And when I use the word they, I'm talking about those who are opposed to the things of God. Period. They may not say they're opposed to the things of God. Did Satan, when he met with Jesus, he didn't say he was opposed to the things of God. He said, hey, you know, if you just do this, then I'll do this. We're good. You're hungry? Ah, there's a rock. Just talk to it. Turn it to bread. We'll be good. Satan never said he was opposed to the things of God, but he is. He is. It might mean that we will end up going to jail, even though we would be following the law. Which, one person stated, that's maybe not so bad, jail ministry. Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but at Joel and Sarah's church, there's a Hispanic church that's tied in with it, and an individual who has been here for several years was pursuing his citizenship, all of a sudden was put into jail. No reason. No reason, just put him to jail. And he was supposed to be meeting with people regarding his citizenship application process. You know, the interesting thing is, this person has communicated back with the church a couple times, and they're saying, keep praying for me, brothers. God is changing lives here. Good. Whoa! This guy's put into jail for no reason that we know of, but he's using it as an opportunity to proclaim Jesus. He's living as a child of light, even in the midst of a dark world, isn't he? It might mean that we get labeled as bigots and as haters. We've been labeled that. We might be even accused of going against the Bible. Well, if your God is a loving God, and it says to judge not, which taking the scripture totally out of context, then you, how can you say this or do this or believe this? Folks, we don't have to defend the Bible. Just live as a child of light. It may even be involved, involved being imprisoned for simply reading passages from the Bible. There was a pastor in Ontario about five years ago that was put into jail because he dared to teach out of Romans chapters 1 and 2. Put in jail. Hate crime, they labeled it. You 
interesting. It may mean getting fired for praying with a football team, even though you're the coach. I hope you know that much from the news this past week. In Washington State, a coach, assistant coach, praying with his team after the game was warned, don't you do it or you'll be fired. He was fired. He was fired. Went to the game last week in the stands with the crowd. The people in the stands said, would you pray with us? I love it. I've heard of high schools where the valedictorian was told not to pray or not to mention the name of Jesus. Not to talk about God. Her whole class sneezed at the same time and everybody said, God bless you. Now you've got to love that creativity, don't you? Now that, that's a little silly, but where, where do we stop? You have to love the way these three followers of God responded. They didn't need the orchestra. They don't need to give an answer to the king. They responded firmly, O oh, king, we will not bow down to this idol. They showed their faith and their living as children of light by trusting in God because they knew he was able to deliver them from this furnace of blazing fire. And they knew that Jehovah God was more powerful than the most powerful man on the face of the earth. And the reality was that even if this one true Jehovah God chose not to physically rescue them at this point in time, they weren't going to change their minds. Didn't matter what the odds were, God was in charge. Stephen Miller comments on this. He says, although no doubt existed in the minds of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego about the ability of their God to deliver them, they humbly accepted the fact that God does not always choose to intervene miraculously in human circumstances, even on behalf of his servants. Even the early church father, Jerome, states, thereby they indicate that it will not be a matter of God's inability, but rather of his sovereign will if they do perish. Brothers and sisters, do you understand how this applies to our lives today? Because we wonder so often why God doesn't just show the reality of his power today. Why does this child have to be killed? Why does that have to happen? Why do all these things take place? And we ask ourselves that question. The reality is that God is able to rescue the Christian from problems and trials, but he does not always choose to do so. Romans 5 reminds us that God sometimes allows difficult times to come into the lives of his children to help us to become more conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, Father, if it be your will, please take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Paul said this, this thorn in his flesh bothered him so tremendously that he prayed three times, Lord, remove this. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. It never was taken away. The reality is we may not always understand why terrible things happen to us even when we're living our lives for Jesus. But then I look at the book of Job. Book of Job, chapter 13, verse 15 says, Though he slays me, yet will I hope in him. One translation says, Though he slays me, yet will I trust him. Brothers and sisters, do we have that mentality? Matthew 10, 28, Jesus told his followers, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, that doesn't mean I'm going to say, hey, bring it on. I'm probably going to be shaking in my boots when it happens. But I know whom I have believed. And Jesus is my Savior. Now, understand there are also those that would suggest that we're to obey the government at all times because of what Paul writes in Romans 13. However, throughout the entirety of the Bible, we are told to not blindly follow in obedience to the government when it runs into <laughs> contradiction of God's ways. Acts chapter 5 verse 29, Acts chapter 4 verse 19 tells us clearly that if obeying the government causes us to disobey God, who do we choose? God. And if we disobey the government, be prepared for the consequences. 
Don't go whining around saying, well, that's not fair. You're, you're going against, I have a right. I'm a U.S. citizen. Well, yeah, we have rights as U.S. citizens. However, you and I as Christians do not have rights. We were bought with a price. We belong to Jesus Christ. And it's possible that we have to go through some of this junk so that we can proclaim Christ to someone else. These three men chose to follow God regardless of the cost. And with boldness like that, with their track record of being upright men of integrity, they've been serving the king with all loyalty, you and I would say, well, surely Nebuchadnezzar would give them a pass, right? God's going to change Nebuchadnezzar's mind. That would, that's what we'd expect, right? That's how we pray many times. I'm not saying it's wrong. So let's see what happens. Well, <laughs> they didn't earn any special favors, did they? Verses 19 through 23. In fact, verse 19 suggests that the king's anger and rage overflowed. His facial expression became completely harsh, and he was boiling with anger. It's almost like his face was contorted with rage. And we see it being fleshed out as he orders at the furnace that already is able to melt any metal is going to be made seven times hotter. Now, trust me, there wasn't somebody there with the thermometer that says, okay, 1,800 times 7, okay, 8 times 7, 56, 5. No, it, that's just an expression. Get that thing as hot as it will go. Make it nuclear, okay? Nebuchadnezzar goes for the overkill now. These are three of his choice young servants. He asks for the best of the best of the best in the military to come and get these guys, tie them up. I mean, after all, they must have been jailbirds. It was overkill, totally. Tie them up, leave their clothing on, because I want this to be a blaze, because when the clothing catch fire, it will be blazing out. Body goes in there, whoosh, ashes. You're not going to be seeing a lot of blazing going on. Okay? So tie them up, make sure they can't get out. And the Bible says that they were thrown into the furnace with their clothes on. Now, why does the scripture state, because the king's command was urgent when he talks about these prized soldiers being burned up at the entrance? It seems that the king's anger probably was so intense and so out of control that he never thought to have his best military officials protect themselves. Get here, do this. And so when they get there, they were killed. And then these guys were thrown into the fire with the clothes on. Now... Verse 23 says, they fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Now, if you and I were a spectator watching this, we might be thinking to ourselves, wouldn't it have been better if these three guys would have just simply bowed down, got it over with, they knew in their hearts that they weren't going to, to really worship, but just go through the motions, God knows your heart, after all, if you stay alive, you can do a lot more for God later on, right? That, that's what a lot of us might think. But for the true follower of Jesus Christ, you understand we cannot compromise. We cannot disobey God. It's imperative that we live as children of light, even in the midst of a dark world. Well, now we have the consternation, verses 24 through 27. This furnace was hotter than any crematory ever was. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, however, is seeing something that is absolutely mind-blowing. The king's reaction here is absolute amazement and astonishment. And just to make sure that, you know, rub the eyes, am I really seeing this? He asks the guys next to him, didn't we throw three people in there? Yeah, yeah, three people, all right. And weren't they all tied up? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they were all tied up. And he points out to them that I'm seeing four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. 
you, you can understand why he probably thought something's going wrong up here. Because this shouldn't be happening. Rather than these three being burned and turned into ashes, he was seeing these three loose from their ropes, clothing still on them, plus one more person walking around freely in the fire. That was probably the most heated discussion they had all day. <laughs> but what stood out was there was one more person. We only threw three in. What's that fourth one doing there? Now there are some that suggest this was an archangel Gabriel. I, I don't buy it because it says he had the appearance like a son of the gods. One translation says the appearance of a god. It's always referring to a deity which is to be worshipped. Now, uh, don't, don't get the idea that Neb oh, Nebuchadnezzar's getting it. No, he's not. He's still part of that pluralistic society. He believes in multiple gods. Now, who is this fourth person? Well, based upon many other appearances in the Old Testament, we probably can assume it's the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And as you look at verse 26, it's easy to assume that Nebuchadnezzar was recognizing the one true God as the Most High God, but, folks, he wasn't recognizing that Jehovah is the only God. He would just say Jehovah is one of many gods, but he's the top one. And as the Jewish men came out of the fire, the Bible shows that Nebuchadnezzar wasn't the only one who had seen this incredible miracle because there proceeded an immediate investigation in verse 27. And they see that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Now, folks, if you come see me after I've been out to the boiler, I smell like smoke. And once in a while, if I'm not too careful, my wife will say, oh, you singed your eyebrows. You know, that's standing a few feet back. It's an easy way to trim your eyebrows, by the way. Uh, but, you know, it's... They were in the midst of this incredible inferno. Nothing. Is that a miracle, folks? Absolutely that's a miracle. Remember last week I said where God is not allowed to rule, he will overrule? That's not my quote, somebody else shared it, and I just love, loved it because it's so true. Because regardless of the earthly outcome, you and I are to live as children of light even in the midst of a dark world. Remember what Peter said. In, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. We, we shouldn't look around scratching our heads saying, Why? Why? Jesus promised it. He says, As they hated me, they will hate you. Now we may wonder... At this point, okay, Nebuchadnezzar's orders to worship the image have been disobeyed. So he enacted the punishment for those three who refused to do that, and that failed. What's going to happen next? Well, interestingly, in verses 28 to 30, we see the commendation. All in all, we see that God has definitely got the attention of Nebuchadnezzar, wouldn't you say? Because this could not have happened unless these three individuals chose to live their lives for God. If they would have compromised, if they would have said to themselves, self, just bow down, just go along with it, don't always be making waves, what's it going to hurt? You know you're not worshiping. And hopefully self says, hey, who do you serve? Because if they would have done that and they would have bowed with everybody else, Nebuchadnezzar would not have seen here the power of God at work with him. And we wouldn't have such a wonderful lesson on the fact that God can choose to rescue or not rescue. Well, the king praises the God of the Hebrew children for his great and powerful display of rescuing these three fellows. We also see that the king was actually impressed by these three, that they trusted in their God enough to defy the king and be willing to die. Let me ask a question of us. 
would we be willing to violate the king's commands and be willing to die in order to not worship any God except Jesus Christ alone? Well, as a result of what Nebuchadnezzar had experienced, he issued a major decree. Basically, now it's against the law to the point of brutal death and destruction of property for anyone to dare to speak against the God of Israel. And as you read that, you're going, wow, that's, that's a turnabout, isn't it? He also makes a comment, <laughs> I like this, there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Uh, it would have been nice if he had said, there is no other God. But he kept a little further. So for this particular time, God chose to work in this manner. But we have to recognize the truth that these men already believe. God is in charge. He could rescue them. He doesn't have to rescue them. Either way, they would choose to live as children of light, even in the midst of a dark world. And if that meant they would no longer be part of this world, that's not an issue, is it? So as we look at the totality of the Bible, and we see this, there's some things that we need to understand even for today. It's helpful to understand that Babylon is more than just the city and the empire during Daniel's time. Babylon actually represents Satan's system in this world. And it goes all the way back to Genesis 10 and 11, doesn't it? The Tower of Babel. It's the idea that we see there as the world attempted to unite as one people to try and work their way to heaven, if you will. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do a similar thing to unite his people and his kingdom with one government and one religion. Warren Wiersbe reminds us that the word Babel literally means the gate of God. Now Satan wants us to understand and to believe that there's a better way. He'd like for us to believe that there are many ways or gates to heaven. Later on, as you look at chapter 17 of Revelation and following, there is a Babylon that will make sure that everything, whether it be possessions, or culture, or religions will be united in one world organization. We're setting ourselves up for that now. Do you realize that? You don't have to be really brilliant to understand this by just reading the news. They're trying to set it up right now for that type of thing. And that's one reason why I, as your pastor, want to do all that I can to help you to know that there is a diametrical opposition between God's truth and Satan's lies. Now some of you are up there looking and saying, I think he's got his math wrong, but the reality is a half-truth plus a half-truth equals one lie. <clears throat> There's no such thing as a white lie. A lie is a lie is a lie. A half-truth is not truth. See, Satan does that with us, doesn't he? He gives us just enough correct information sprinkled in with his lie. It's a lie. Very simply. There are many who suggest that the proof that there is not only one way to heaven through Jesus Christ is the fact that there are so many wonderful, loving, caring religions. Humanism, <coughs> Islam, etc. And to the pagan mind, to the worldly mind, that makes sense. But for those of us with the mind of Christ, we know better. Because there's a major cavern between true Christianity and the religions of this world. And I don't care how nice they may look like. If Jesus Christ is not the only way to heaven, if God is not the one true God, they're lies. I don't care how sweet and nice and fuzzy they might be. It's a difference between life and death. You see, just because Babylon defeated Jerusalem, that didn't make them right. And it did not make their God stronger than Jehovah. You see, if God delivered these three Hebrew men from this fiery furnace, can't he deliver you and me from those who would dare to oppress us who are serving Satan's purposes? And yet, for you and I, we know by faith in God's word, 
some very basic truths. So we are killed for our faith. Paul writes, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. We know that Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. Doesn't matter how dark and damp the dungeon is, Christ's presence is there with the follower of Christ. We also know that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And you know something? I know that one day I shall be holy. I shall see him face to face just as he is. And don't you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You stay true to me. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, live as children of light, even in the midst of a very dark world. Let's stand as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the words of encouragement from the Bible, for the example we've seen in Daniel chapter 3. <laughs> and Father, we have been very protected here in North America. We have not yet been brought to that point of death, public execution, because of our faith in you. But Father, give us the strength to live our lives as children of light. Help us to be winsome, not arrogant, not harsh, not belligerent, but help us to share the love of Jesus with others in such a way that they will see Christ in us. And when we're called upon to compromise, help us to boldly and lovingly refuse. And help us to make it understood that we will worship Jesus alone. Father, we don't know what the days and weeks and months and years hold for us. We know you know, and so we walk in faith, trusting you every step of the way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.